So today on Tech Talk, we have a PABX unit. This is about, uh, oh, I don't know, 30, maybe more years old. This came out of an old office and, uh, well, it was just clicking. And what this is, is this is a, a private access branch exchange unit. It's a, basically a key switched phone system that connects an office phone system to the outside world. So basically what this did was this connected the central office to the office stations. And the office could have multiple handsets and uh, this would allow them, it's a, it's a model EK612 key telephone system. So this is a very old system and not in use anymore and this unit is basically going to go to the recycle bin so I figured before tossing it in the recycle bin we'll take it apart and see what uh, makes this thing tick. On the other side of the unit there's the CO inputs so this was a six line system so you have your six telephone lines coming in from the central office this is going to the telephone exchange system so the six lines would come into here and this unit would then interface with multiple uh, handsets they could have you know they could have 20 handsets in a business and basically what it does is it allows all of those phone sets to access all six of the outgoing lines as well as they would have features uh, such as intercoms between the offices so that uh, one office could call another on an internal um, system so typically a system like this uh, this would be for a small office and um, you know they dial nine to get out or if they just are they could just dial their local uh, their local uh, number four their other stations so if we had 20 stations for example they could just dial the the number of digits for the station that they wanted the local exchange station that they wanted to uh, to communicate with or if they wanted to access an outside line they would dial nine and what this would do is it would typically find the first available line and these were typically used on an over what they called overline system it didn't have to be it could be six individual numbers but typically it was a, what they called an overline system where the first call coming in would automatically ring on line one if line one was busy and someone dialed the business it would then follow through to line two line three etc and if someone picked up a phone to, dot, to make an outside call it would find the first available line that was available to be used or this could be programmed if if the business say wanted to make all their outgoing calls starting at line six it would start on the number six spot first and work its way back or depending on how many lines the business had anyway this was basically the brains to the the uh, to the business and this is again very old technology so let's crack this thing open and uh, take a look inside it I picked this up I was just taking out a system today at work and uh, this is going into recycling so I figured out oh, before I toss this thing in the bin let's uh, crack it open and that plug on the bottom that's probably for battery backup because this thing does require power in order to operate. The power for the phones themselves would typically come from the central office because each incoming line would have the central office battery of 48 volts on it. But this unit itself requires its own power source to operate. So that would be for a battery backup, typically a 12 volt battery just to run the electronics that's in this unit here in the event of a power failure. Most of these units, they were set up in such a way that if there was a power failure, they would default to line one. So if someone picked up a phone, it would automatically go on the, the first line if there was no backup power. But uh, at least that's the way most of these things were configured. So a couple of screws on the top cover should come off this thing quite easily. And if it doesn't, just need to get it coaxing. As you can see there's a lot, there's a lot of parts in this thing. So we've got 18 isolation transformers here. So I think this is probably would, would handle 18, up to 18 phones that would be connected to this connector. This connector basically connected over to a Bix block or a 66 block that would allow um, the individual phones. And typically each phone would, would might be two or four wires depending on how this one is designed but uh, anyway this thing's got a battery backup on it as you can see it has a rechargeable battery on here 
that's to uh, keep the system up and running in the event of a power failure until the power comes back. And we've got a transformer over here. So I'll salvage what parts out of this thing I can because there's going to be parts in here that are, are useful. So before I crash this thing, you know, parts like the transformer, the circuit breaker and stuff, I'll be able to salvage them. Uh, the ICs and stuff, uh, they're, not, they're not really much use for anything. They're pretty old technology, so that'll all be going into the bin. But I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pull off on this thing what I can, and, uh, and then we'll uh, end of life this thing some way. Of course, as soon as I apply power to it, it's going to do exactly the same thing that it was doing when I picked it up, and that's just relays are clicking. And that's what I picked this up. Trouble call for this was uh, clicking relays. I'm thinking that uh, probably the relays on here, these are all okay. I'm going to uh, salvage these relays. I'm seeing which one's clicking. One of these relays is ticking. Oh, this IC is getting warm too. One part I am going to salvage right away is this transformer as you never know when you're going to need another transformer for something and uh, you know this is a uh, one piece that uh, is going to be good so we'll take that out sure these things are really well built. This thing's been in operation you know, for well it hasn't been used in it hasn't been used in over 20 years but the thing was still powered up when I arrived on site to uh, decommission it. This thing was still powered up and it had been powered up all those years. It just hadn't been used for anything. It had been disconnected and just left sitting in the closet um, with power still applied to it. So I'm just going to cut some of these ties. there we go. This transformer is, uh, I know it says what the voltage is, but uh, it'll be easy enough to measure this up. It's just a, it's just a center tap transformer. The black and white, obviously, are the primary. It's just a center tap transformer. So this one here, I'll be able to measure that and see what uh, that has got. Next thing I can take out of this thing is this circuit breaker. You never know when a good old press to reset uh, circuit breaker can come in handy. This thing is rated at uh, one amp. So there's a one amp resettable circuit breaker. Always good, can come in handy for something. Also salvage the cord. This is a nice heavy duty, uh, you know, good commercial three prong cord. So it's always good to have one of those kicking around. So let's salvage that too. There. Okay. I've got a few parts that here I'm going to salvage. The rest of this stuff. Well, let's just take a look at these ICs and see what they are. Here's a couple of Mitsubishi processors. This looked to be an A107-003-01 and a 107-147-52. And then the number on an M5L8049, a dash 601 and a dash 604. These are probably custom um, CPUs. Looks like we've got over here, this looks to be an EEPROM. And we can tell that because uh, it's got a sticker over the top which I 
typically will cover up the, the, pro, the, the erasing window with a sticker to keep light away from it because these EEPROMs should have a it should have a clear window on top here underneath this sticker which it does this is old school so you don't see things with EEPROMs in them anymore uh, how these EEPROM ICs work for those that don't know this was a TMS 2764 and it's probably a 64 K it'd be very small um, capacity but uh, basically you'll see this that's the silicon wafer underneath there so there's the silicon wafer and all the bonding wires that connect it to the outside world and basically this is the earliest form of erasable uh, programmable read-only memory that's what EEPROM stands for erasable programmable read-only memory in the early days, there was two types of read-only memory. Well, actually, there's three types of read-only memory. There's there's ROM, which the program is etched in when the chip is being manufactured, and it's programmed at the factory. It's basically hard-coded. And then there was the programmable read-only memory. A programmable read-only memory was a chip very similar to this that could be programmed in the field once it was manufactured so they could turn out identical blanks and the application would be loaded you know by the manufacturer for each individual device and once they were programmed they were programmed permanently you could never ever change it the other type of programmable read-only memory was the erasable programmable read-only memory or EEPROM which is what this is and what this window is for is to erase the chip and how you erase the chip is you shine a strong ultraviolet light in through that window so to erase it and it, it's, it's not instantaneous it takes a period of time typically it would take you know 15 to 20 minutes to erase a, a, a fully erase an EEPROM chip but it was great for when you were developing a program that, that may ultimately have been headed for a prom but for field testing it would burn it onto an EEPROM. That way, if you had to make changes to your code, you didn't have to throw your chips away. You could just take your chip, put it in an EEPROM eraser, erase it, and start over again. And they're very popular for a lot of applications like this because this was field upgradable. You know, if new features came out, they could program it onto an EEPROM, send it out to technicians in the field, and the technician in the field could just come along and, you know, pop the chip out, socket it, pop the chip out, pop in a new one, and it was ready to go and then he could take the other chip and he could send it back and they could reuse the chip whereas a prom uh, was one that once it was programmed if uh, a change was made they had to start over again and throw the chip out so EEPROMs made sense in that respect we don't see EEPROMs anymore this is a very old technology now everything is all flash based where you can electrically erase it so that was the next the next type of chip that replaces was called the double EEPROM and that stood for electrically erasable programmable read-only memory what that was the predecessor to what is now referred to as flash memory your USB sticks your SD cards and everything they're based on EEPROM but they operate much faster than EEPROM the original double EEPROM you had to erase each sector before you could use it so you would erase each each, each individual sector would be erased and and rewritten whereas on the flash memory you can erase in blocks and you can do it on the fly so it's a little little faster that's technology advances for us here so the double e prom it's a couple crystals on this thing here take a look at those where are they here there they are looks like 11 megahertz on that one can't see that one with the lighting in here that's an 11 megahertz crystal as well i can see that now the lights are starting to come up here Again, this thing is loaded and loaded with ICs. These are all going to be uh, digital ICs for the most part, TTL and so forth. A lot of Motorola MC142100.
There's all the relays there. ITT sealed relays, they're good units. So what these transformers are, you see on this side of the board, these are the isolation for the, uh, the telephone network. So there's six of them. One for each of the incoming lines. That isolates the actual KSU from the telephone network. And then these other transformers on the other side, there's 18 of them. And they would be the transformers for the outgoing handsets that interface. So that's how we know this one here could support up to 18 phones because each phone handset would have one transformer for it. It's possible that it may only be a nine line version too because depending on the setup, it could have been a two transformers per, uh, per, per handset or one transformer per handset, but this is probably an 18 or capable of 18 lines. Uh, there's the, That's a what we call a bodge board. That's something that uh, Dave Jones would call a bodge board anyway. And that was just an, an additional board that was added after the fact because somebody messed something up. Something wasn't right and uh, they had to modify it and add this board with the four transistors and some resistors and connect it to various points on the, on the circuit because an update was made and there, or there was a problem after it went out of, in production and they discovered that there was a problem so they come out rather than redesign the whole board they just added this little bodge board and every one of those units would have been uh, done by hand after the it was after the unit was manufactured this would have been added on after the fact as you can see there's the bottom side of the board there are no components on the bottom side of this board all the components are all through hole and they're all mounted on the top side it is a double sided board as you saw but this is old school manufacturing and these units are, were very reliable had this unit not started just clicking recently had it still been in service it probably would have still worked <laughs> Thank you. 
As a bonus, let's say bye bye to a laptop. I think that CPU is kind of foobarred now. I guess you could say that this EEPROM chip is erased permanently.